All right, everyone, guess what? I have a surprise. Just when you thought it was over, it's not over, y'all. Our special guest is finally here. <laughs> not sure exactly what may have happened, but we're going to find out because this man here, you know what? When you have a career like he has, you can do whatever you like. <laughs> you can do whatever because this man has lived an incredible, incredible career, some that I'm definitely envious on. This man here, born and raised in St. Louis, he has been with KC95 for 46 years, y'all. 46 years. 38 seasons as the Cardinals PA announcer. Longtime co-host of the Cardinals Kids TV show on Valley Sports Midwest. He is a married man, a happily married man. He's a father. Once again, if you saw on, on uh, the promo, he's a guy that I say has to have one of the coolest jobs in America. Has to have one. To be, of course, a part of the best fans of baseball to be a part of the Cardinals organization for as long as he has. And Joe is about to get back on as well because she logged off and she's like, oh, wait a minute. He's, he's, he's here. I'm like, yep, come on back. <laughs> so some told me don't, don't, don't let go yet. But uh, once again, he has one of the best jobs ever in my eyes. And he'll probably say, KC95 probably has the same, probably the same neck and neck as, Cardinals baseball as well. But when you go to Bush Stadium, you automatically hear this man's voice when you go to the to the stadium. And I can't wait to ask him so many questions about his career and in, in regards to broadcasting or in regard excuse me, in regards to being the radio, or of course being at Cardinals baseball games. So Joe, you ready to rock and roll? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, all right, let's go. All right, and once again, for our listeners on Hot 365 Radio, we're back already. The show isn't over because we have our special guest. They may call him the professor. Some call him the U-Man. We call him one of the legends here in St. Louis. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cardinals PA announcer, also radio legend at KC95, Mr. John Hewlett. How you doing, sir? Hi. Hi. How are you all? Oh, <laughs> let me apologize right out of the box. My God, I got the notice that it was about almost time to go, and then I got sidetracked by something here at the house, and then I started working on a show I got to do for tomorrow, and I just blew it, and I'm so embarrassed. Uh, I, I apologize, and thank you for having me tonight. It is definitely our honor. We understand things happen, so, you know, I'm someone who likes to keep a positive mindset, so... I was hoping that if it wasn't tonight, that we can, you know, reschedule at a, you know, a different time, to, you know, for your convenience, because we definitely want to get you on and have you be part of our show. So we definitely appreciate you. Once again, for those watching, thank you very much for staying on. I, I didn't end the stream. We're back. So hopefully, Mr. Well, Williams can, one of I can do whatever you'd like. I mean, you know, we can come back next time since I blew it like this and, uh, and start from the beginning or – or oh no! I was oh, no, you good. oh no! You, you're good right here. Go ahead and stay on. You're good to go. So, oh, one thing that you can do, if you don't mind, if you could turn your your cell phone uh, sideways, so you can get, get your full okay. video. There we go. Better. Okay. Yep, much better. So, once again, thank you for taking time out of your time to be on the show. I know you are a very very busy man. And your voice is always used up a lot. <laughs> am I am I right? Well, you know what's going on right now. The reason why I kind of missed this opportunity is I'm I'm really working hard to get ahead on on my radio shows at Casey because I'm going to be um, doing the show from Phoenix, Arizona, for two months. Uh, the morning show for two months, and so I have specialty shows that have to be all uh, recorded well in advance of that. So I'm, I'm kind of working day and night trying to get all these different specialty shows uh, prepared for and then recorded and, and put on, on in the in the uh, in the files so they can run them while I'm not in town. So that's what I've been working on here the past, you know, couple of weeks. 
And I'm glad that you brought that up because that's something I definitely want to, you know, discuss in regards to your preparation. Because with me being a, a producer, uh, host, yeah. uh, I'm also a DJ as well. There's so many, so many things you got to do to prepare yourself, not just for the right now, but for days ahead. So yeah, definitely want to yeah. get into that as well. But before I continue, Joe, Mr. John Hewlett, the U-Man, the professor, John Hewlett, our, our uh, baseball and hockey guru, <laughs> Joe. <Hello. laughs> nice Hi, to Joe. meet you. Hi, nice to meet you too. Yes, yes, yes. So once again, this is your Wednesday Night Sports Light. We're back. We're live. Bring them comments, y'all. Let's get it going as we have the you man on the show. So yeah. one of the first questions that we love to ask our special guests is, uh, when will you say was that time that you fell in love with sports? With sports? Yes, sir. Oh, well, uh, I guess, uh, you know, first first inklings I have of being a sports fan was was the 1967 World Series when the Cardinals were playing the uh, Detroit Tigers. I'm sorry, the uh, Boston Red Sox. And and they won that World Series. And I remember it's the first time I ever saw my dad and other family members so excited about a sport, you know. Now, me as a kid, ever since I r- ran across a ball, I was always interested, you know. Any kind of ball just got my attention. I think it's the greatest toy ever invented. Uh, can't think of anything that rivals it. And so uh, yeah, even to this day, if you got a ball somewhere, you got my attention. Let's throw it. Let's play catch, you know, or do something with it. And so uh, that's that was my earliest when the Cardinals won the World Series in 1967. Of course, having no idea that <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> someday I would eventually be working for them. Right, right, right. So, man, doing the World Series during that time frame, I know that definitely had to be, like you said before, the, the one of the reasons why you fell in love with sports right there. So, yeah, we are really big in regards to not just what's going on now but your upbringing from the time that you were a kid to where you are now. So how would you describe yourself, Mr. John Hewlett, in regards to a young athlete, if you was? Oh, I guess, uh, you know, I'd be considered uh, uh, maybe slightly above average. I mean, uh, I I played uh, baseball and, and, uh, you know, well, I didn't get into golf till I was 25. And, you know, we had some mean – touch foot i mean the tackle football games in the neighborhood when we were kids and stuff like that but you know back when when i was younger when i was young sports wasn't everywhere you know it wasn't everywhere on tv i mean the cardinal games were occasionally televised back then it might have been just on the weekends or something but you didn't have sports 24 hours a day everywhere like you have now so so uh, <laughs> excuse me i'm just getting over a cold um so you know uh football i mean i don't even remember football being on tv when i was a kid to be honest with you so you know so i was exposed to all the different sports slowly but surely and uh, by the time i i was aware of all of them and and liked all of them i was i was beyond my ability and you know beyond the age where anybody would even start to think about you play something seriously you know <laughs> and what would you say is uh your your first love in golf to sports wise uh, I'd say, well, now it's probably golf, but I still play softball. I play old man softball in over 60 leagues. And uh, um, I love do. I, I fell in love with softball again after not playing it for like 30 years when raising a family. And then, uh, yeah, and then golf and uh, pickleball. Uh, I've become a fairly serious pickleball player. And what else? I still run. I, I, I you know, I love, at, you know, challenging my body athletically and, 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 working out and doing things like that. So I'm trying to stay active and alive at 65, but, uh, you know, it's getting a little harder. And it's so funny how you brought up pickleball. Cause I had that as one of my questions. Cause I noticed on your page, how you had, um, you know, the rackets on there and everything paddles on there. Yeah. I've also, I've all started to fall in love with pickleball. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a very fun game. And yeah. like, as soon as I realized about the game, now I'm seeing, the guys like LeBron James and Tom Brady, now they're yeah. being owners of, of leagues and, and teams and stuff. So what is it about pickleball that grabbed your attention? And why do you feel like now the world is starting to know about pickleball? Well, I started playing about, uh, I guess, four years ago. And before it really was starting to get popular, my wife started playing. She said, come on, you got to play this game, pickleball. It's a fun game. And I pickleball, 
I'm not going to play anything s- stupid called pickleball. And uh, so I just went with her one time. I go, oh, this isn't bad. And then all of a sudden I started, I, I love the fact that it's, it's about, um, especially if somebody who's, who's older like myself, although young people have taken over the sport now and, you know, they're, they're taking it to incredible heights. But, but for someone older like myself, it's good to continue to uh, keep your hand, hand-eye coordination sharper and, and flexibility and, and uh, 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 some endurance in there. And uh, just, just, you know, I use my whole body when I'm playing pickleball. You know, I'm down low, I'm crouching down low. And, and, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the judgment, the skills of hitting the ball just barely over the net, you know, the third shot drop is a real important shot in pickleball and, and things like that. It's very challenging. And, uh, you know, it, it gets heated. And, and I love being at the front line there. And, you know, I got my goggles on and I don't give a shit. To, oh, sorry. I don't care. Uh, you know, you can hit, 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 <laughs> hit the ball hit the ball as hard as you want at me and it hit me. I don't care. And I'm going to try to do the same to you. And it gets kind of, you know, pretty, uh, pretty intense. And I, and I, and I love that aspect of it. I love, I played, I played in tournaments and, uh, a partner of mine and I, uh, we finished second in the Midwest regionals. I guess it was 20, 2020. We got beat by a couple of young guys from Minneapolis for the gold medal, but, uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, Joe, have you tried any, any pickleball yet or seen people play? I just had to Google it whenever you guys were talking about it. I never even heard of it before. I, I know playing pickle like, you know, baseball, you know, but I've never heard of actual pickleball. So, yeah. 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 yeah check it out. I mean, like like um, uh, the uh, greats in the sports world are investing in it and and they're serious about it, man. They're, I don't I, it's going to be a, it's probably going to be just as big as tennis. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, because like now you see it on ESPN and in every other sports network, so it's definitely a, a big deal now. And like I said, I love it. Uh, Joe, you get a chance, yeah. check out my, my, my reel on my personal page, you'll okay. see me and, and the wife be playing uh pickleball, so <laughs> it's very fun, very fun thing to do. And I definitely enjoy it. And I recommend it for anyone out there, try it out. Uh, you, you'll like yeah. it, you'll like it, yeah, you definitely will like it. So uh, going back to your younger years, uh, what school did you go to? High school? Well, uh, well, uh, I, I grew up in the city, uh, uh, and I went to uh, uh, St. John Nepomuk Catholic School on uh, uh, 11th and Lafay- Lafayette <clears throat> and until I was in sixth grade. Then they closed that, and I went to another school. And then uh, I went to Bishop DeBerg High School for four years. Wow. So uh, it was all, it was uh, all Catholic education for 12 years. Okay. And during that time, did you partake in any sports seriously? Well, I started to play baseball at uh, Duberg, and uh, the first year uh, I was a freshman, I tried to make the B team, and I got cut. And uh, I got cut because they took my brother over me, and that kind of hurt. And <laughs> he was lefty, so you know, he, the left, left, uh, left, left-handed throwers were pretty rare back then. And then, uh, so then I shut it down and went to broadcast center, and I played. Uh, in high school anymore after that i did play my so- sophomore year in high school baseball but that was it i ran track I, I when i got cut from the baseball team as a freshman i ran track so and we and when you played baseball what was your position uh i was the pitcher and that was that's all i did i just pitched mm. so it's pretty cool because joe doing her her younger years she was an outstanding catcher really yeah, my knees can't take it anymore, though. <laughs> yeah, that is demanding on the knees, no doubt about that. Yeah, but hey, has your did your brother go on to play anywhere after high school? Because you still no. have a career in, your, <laughs> in what you did in high school. Yeah, no, no, he didn't either. Uh, you know, back then, sports was it was it was it's something you did in high school and. You know, I don't think anybody ever thought they had the opportunity to play anything beyond that because there were no club teams back then to where you could actually get really, really good, you know. And um, uh, once high school was finished, we all we just had to go get jobs, man. Had to go earn some money. We got lucky. We just missed the draft. You know, the Vietnam War was ending. And so Mm. we kind of got lucky in that regard. Remember being a kid growing up watching the news and and seeing the uh, you know reports from vietnam uh, on the tv all the time and thinking oh my god am i headed for that and we got lucky and that that didn't happen but uh yeah it's kind of scary for a little while and, 
And going back real quick to pickleball, when people see you play locally, do they be like, wait a minute, aren't you? Or do, do people like, you know, don't even trip off who you are? No, they, they yeah, people acknowledge, uh, who, you know, that they listened on the radio for a long time or they hear me down at the ballpark. And I, I think it probably makes them want to beat me more. Uh, it, uh, I kind of <laughs> feel a sense of an increase in intensity once they find out they, they want to they beat, beat the you man. So Right, right. <laughs> I got bragging rights. I beat the U man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why you got to try to be, got to be ready. You know, you can't, can't think. And pickleball too is a game where you can easily uh, over, I mean, under underestimate your opponent. You know, just by looks, you go, oh, I think I can beat this person. You know, it might not look that athletic, but you don't judge a book by its cover because I've seen some of the people who you wouldn't think would be necessarily great pickleball players and they got the shots down, man, and they'll make you look bad. Hmm. Yeah, see, just you talking about it right now. I can't wait till I get, go back out there to the pickleball court and do my thing, you know. Yeah, so. well, we should play sometime. <laughs> oh, I'd yeah. love to play with you. Yeah, we'll, we'll make that happen. We'll, we got to have like a platform sports talk show uh, outing or something like that. Get everybody together and we can make it happen. So stay tuned. Pickleball folks. special, yeah. There we go. Stay tuned. We'll, we'll make it happen on the platform <laughs> sports talk show. So. You brought it up earlier in regards to why you stopped playing sports and I was getting to radio. What was it about radio that captivated you and, and piqued your interest? Well, it was connected to sports. You know, hearing Jack Buck do the Cardinal games on Camo X radio back in the days, And I remember thinking, boy, what a great, interesting job that must be. And, you know, and I'd also hear him on, on other shows on, on the station and, you know, because Jack was very entertaining. He, he, he was funny and he was he was good on the radio when he wasn't just doing baseball either. And it just got my attention. I remember as a young guy sitting on the front steps of my of our uh, four family flat down there on 18th Street, just dreaming one day that I wanted to be on the radio like Jack Buck. And of course, nobody could ever be Jack Buck. But, you know, I wanted a career like that. And I'll be damned if it didn't come true. Hmm. It was, so you know, how did you... Oh, well, sorry. I uh, well, I was uh, listening to the radio one day. I knew I wasn't going to be able to go to college because we my parents didn't have that kind of money. So uh, I heard on the radio one day an advertisement for Broadcast Center. It was a radio school that I, and I don't know if they're still around or not, to be honest with you. And it was nine hundred dollars for the for the course. I was 16, 16 years old <clears throat> and, and, and in high school. And my mom and dad said, yeah, we'll go see it. We went out there and I mean, they were probably begging for, for students. I mean, uh, to take a 16 year old kid who, you know, his voice hadn't even changed yet. It was like, you know, they saw the $900 before they saw me actually. And, and they accepted me and one thing led to another and then my voice did change. And, you know, uh, they kind of used that for a long time as a, as a, a, a promotional spot. We can make your voice, you know, sound so much better. And they use my before my voice change <laughs> audio, and then max that up to my afterwards my voice change audio. And wow, man, that's amazing! How they do that with that guy? Well, it's just called uh, maturity. <laughs> So, yeah. And so, yeah. So as I was, I was going to the school there and then, uh, by the time I was, I guess I was, yeah, I was a senior in high school and KEZK at 102.5 was signing on the air for the first time. And the guy who was going to be the program director for that station was also teaching at the broadcast center, earning some extra money before, uh, they put this, before he got to, got to work at the station. And, he heard me doing my stuff there at Broadcast Center. He said, uh, hey, would you like to work weekends on KEZK? And I went, holy crap. Yeah, man, I'd, that'd be awesome. So <clears throat> I told my parents about it. And they were excited about it. So that was all set to happen. And then he came to me uh, like a, a month or so later and said, hey, we need somebody to do 7 to midnight, Monday through Saturday. I know you're a senior in high school. Can you, can you think you can pull that off and still keep your, your grades up at school? And, you know, it's a full-time job on a major market radio station. I was still at this little broadcast school. And I said, hell, yeah, I think I can. And I had to get permission from my teachers. And my parents had to write letters to the school. And 
the, the station manager had to write a letter to the principal at DeBerg High School asking that I could do that. And if my grades didn't keep up, they'd fire me. And, um, and that's how I ended up getting my foot in the door. That was 1974, fall of 74. So um, that's, how I, that's, that's how it started. So did you have or, or start taking any certain classes to, you know, get better in your craft as you were growing into getting into radio? Uh, well, I, mean, I still continued to do the, the lessons there at Broadcast Center while I was on the air there at KEZK and going to high school. So, yeah, I mean, and, and I was learning on the job, too. You know, that that was that was a big part of it. And I was, all of a sudden I was around professional broadcasters and I, you know, I would listen to them and and uh, try to emulate them in the production room when it came to reading commercials and things like that. And it was it was very valuable experience. But it was KEZK back then, and they were playing elevator music. And when I say elevator music, I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, Harry Mancini Orchestra and 101 Strings and uh, Ray Conniff and, you know, just really uh, uh, laid-back instrumental music. Music. Muzak. I don't know if you remember the Muzak systems that you hear in elevators and stuff. Hence right, the right. Uh, yeah, hence the name elevator music. Well, you know, I was into rock and roll and, and uh, that wasn't getting the job done for me after a while. And so uh, in the uh, summer of 75, because I got the job there in 74, fall of 74, summer of 75, one thing led to another and I thought I'm going to have to move on from this. And uh, they replaced me in the evenings with Joel Myers, who, who was also uh, at one point Cardinals PA announcer. So, um, oh, boy. Yeah. And so anyway, so I left there and I went to KIRL, which was a, a top 40 radio station in St. Charles, Missouri, 1430 a.m., 1460, no, 1430, no, 1460. Yeah. And um, uh, that was the summer of 75. And then in the fall of 75, the guys uh, who manage broadcast center said, hey, we got a job for you out in Jefferson City, AM, FM combination stations, KLIK and KJFF. Would you want to leave town and go there? And uh, I did, and I went there for eight months. And then in the spring of 76, I got a call from Ron Stevens, who was the program director at Casey Radio. And he had heard a tape of me and he uh, he wanted to hire me for, for Casey. And initially I didn't I didn't want to go to, go to Casey because even though I was into rock and roll, Casey was pretty far out there. I mean, you know, it, uh, it had this reputation of being the, you know, a, a, drug head station, a druggy station. And, you know, I wanted to be in sports broadcasting at some point. So it didn't seem like the direction I needed to go in. So Brown says I turned the job down three times. I remember at least once. And uh, so he was persistent and he eventually got me to say yes, because I met coming home, you know, I can be back with my friends and uh, my family and my girlfriend and stuff. So uh, I took the job and I've been there ever since. I was 19. And that is awesome to be able to have a job. You know, some people nowadays, they have a hard time trying to keep a job just for one year. But for you to be there <laughs> for, for over 40 years is definitely amazing. So <laughs> what goes through your mind when you see this photo right here? Oh, that one. Yeah. Uh, how about that mustache, man? <laughs> 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 that mustache and that and that black hair and whew. uh yeah i mean that studio we were in crestwood back then and the studio was in a, it was a in, a in a cinder little small little cinder block building that was right next to the 66 drive-in and it looked like the popcorn stand for the drive-in through the fence you know i mean it was that that's how uh small and unassuming this building was but inside this little building some of the history, great history of rock and roll was evolving here in St. Louis. And it was it was Casey Radio that that helped start the careers of bands like Journey and Rush and um, just so many groups that eventually met Sticks, uh, so many groups that made it to superstar level. And to this day, I'll do interviews with some of the guys that are in those bands. <coughs> Excuse me. And they'll still recall those days uh, coming to Casey, coming to that little cinder block building out there in Crestwood on Watson Road and and the station helping them build their career. And, uh, uh, you know, they're very grateful to this day because radio was so important 
to developing music artists back then, more so than now, because you know you have the internet now and and people hear their music in so many different ways or have access to new music in so many different ways. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man. And so, um, uh, you know, it was just radio was pretty much the only way. So, you know, we built a sl close association with all those artists. And, uh, you know, it was just a thrill to be able to to be a part of what was going on at that radio station, helping expose these artists to to rock listeners in St. Louis and and uh you know uh, we have uh we we have it still going on 55 years later at the radio station and uh, it's it's a uh, it's been so rewarding to be able to look back on my career and and know that i actually lived through that and and was a part of that you know who's some of your uh favorite bands oh gosh i i I, I tell you, you have to ask me which ones I don't like, to be honest with you. There's a few of those because I, I like them all. You know, I mean, I was always interested in, in, in all of them and what, what they had to offer musically. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, bands that, that led different genres, I think, are interesting. Like like a band like Yes, I think, you know, as far as progressive rock goes, uh, that, that's, that's always been one of my favorite groups. And John Anderson was with his unique singing voice. And, uh, you know, when it came, came to, to, I guess, new wave, uh, uh, the police, I, you know, I was found a very interesting band. And uh, the, initially our audience hated them, you know, and I get that new wave crap off the air. That's not rock and roll. And of course, they eventually went on to be great, a great band, Tom Petty, you know, the late Tom Petty. And, uh, you know, he, he, he was another guy who was very grateful to what Casey did for him back in those early days, you know, because he struggled. At, he was bigger in England than he was or in, in Europe and especially England than he was in the United States for a while. Our audience hated him initially, but we persevered and pushed through and kept playing Tom Petty records. And now you, you laugh when you think back and say, what? How could people see that as a genre of music that was you know, not worth playing? And so, you know, uh, those are the type of artists that I... <laughs> that I have kind of a special affinity for because they were, they broke through when what they were doing wasn't necessarily popular, you know? <laughs> so, so you brought up earlier, Oh, Joe brought up in regards to your favorite band, but with you being in radio, who was that first uh, celebrity guest that you saw that you was like, that you met? Uh, <laughs> well, and you was uh, like, wow, I, I, I made it. This is big time. This is awesome. Well, the first uh, guess that guy that I met as a celebrity, I think, was Billy Joel. And Billy Joel, I was out in front of the station one day. This was 76, late 76, early 77. And I was standing out in the parking lot of uh, the studio there in Crestwood. And uh, a green rambler comes down the driveway and a guy gets out and it's Billy Joel. And he had hitchhiked to the station from his hotel, which was downtown. He was going to be playing the Ambassador Theater that night. And yeah, he hitched hike and then he got out, he's got a baseball cap on and <clears throat> he said, is this Casey radio? And I said, yeah, it is. And I recognized him <coughs> and I took him inside the station. And, uh, I don't think I did the interview that day It was somebody else. I think maybe Mark Close did that interview and we still have a picture of that day. I'm not in it, unfortunately, but uh, it's a picture of him with that baseball cap on standing outside the, the radio station. That was the first time I met somebody who was. He was popular then, but he wasn't the superstar yet that he was going to be. He was about to become. It was right before the Stranger album when he when he showed up that day. <laughs> and to be able to say that you met, you know, people who you already seen, you know, on 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 TV or here on the radio, that has to be such an awesome feeling. Is, is there a celebrity guest or a guest uh, that you always have wanted to meet that you have not met yet? Well, yeah, Paul McCartney. Now, I've interviewed him on the phone, seen him on, on the phone one time. I was part of a gang interview. There were several of us who were asking him questions. And, you know, it's it's an honor to be able to say I talked to Paul McCartney on the phone, but it's not the same as meeting him, you know. So, yeah, that, that would have been great. And I've also interviewed Ringo Starr, so I got two of the four Beatles on the phone, wow. but not but not in person. Um, uh, well, I met the Rolling Stones in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, we, uh, the radio station used to send us all over the place to do broadcast. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore, but, um, I was with, uh, a, a 
several a number of radio stations from around the country that Anheuser Push put together to go see the Rolling Stones in Moscow, play in Russia, first time. You know, this was the, when the when the uh, Cold War was still kind of going on, but it was starting to starting to end. And uh, we ended up not seeing them in in Moscow because the, the show got canceled for some reason. We ended up in Moscow without seeing the Rolling Stones, but we did also see them in Copenhagen, Denmark, and we got to meet them that day. And uh, it's one of my favorite pictures of myself with Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and all the guys in the band and, and the, the other folks from the other radio stations around the country who were all with us that day. So uh, that, that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's definitely really awesome. Uh, Joe, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's someone out there musically that you'd be like, man, if I met this person, <laughs> man, it'd be crazy. Who's yeah. That, that come up in top of your mind, Joe. Oh man. Well, I mean, I'm not going to say the ones of uh, today's music that I like because I don't want to embarrass myself on the show. But I don't know. Metallica, that's one that I love. I would like yeah. love to go see them at Bush Stadium next year because I know they're coming back. But um, Yeah, for two nights. Yeah, which is crazy. And then uh, one, obviously, that you, know, you want to be able to see the legit real experience. But Queen was always I, – I love Queen. They got a lot of great oh, yeah. music. So um, that's one there that I would love to see as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's two good ones there for sure. Yeah. You know, and, and outside of outside of music, I got to meet Muhammad Ali, and wow. got my picture taken with uh, with uh, Muhammad Ali uh, down at Bush Stadium. Uh, he came down to throw out a first pitch, and then also he was in town for. Well, his manager was Butch Lewis, and Butch Lewis was promoting these two young men from St. Louis. They were twins might have been identical twins i think it's the fingers brothers and he was going to take them to new heights and they were they were in the lighter uh, weight class but he brought in joe frazier muhammad ali uh michael spinks uh, all of them were there for this boxing match that was going to take place in the powerhouse at union station that's where casey eventually ended up being in the powerhouse that's where our studios were for a long time but but at that time we had a we had a restaurant there it was the Real Rock restaurant. And they had the boxing ring set up inside that building there. And so come fight night, um, I got I got a boxing glove and I got Muhammad Ali to sign the boxing glove. And then before the fight started, they're going to bring out the champs. They're going to bring out Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali and Michael Spinks. And they were going to introduce me too. I was in the lineup as, as well. I was going to be sitting ringside with them because you know the radio station was was a sponsor because it was in our restaurant and everything. <clears throat> so the music starts pounding and and real loud, and the announcers making all kinds of you know noise. And he introduces Michael Spinks, and Michael Spinks goes out, and we're, we're standing on some steps from the second floor to the first floor because the dressing rooms where we were you know, were upstairs. So Joe Frazier was in front of me. Muhammad Ali was right behind me. And the music's playing. And they're about ready to introduce Joe Frazier to come out. And Muhammad Ali leans over my shoulder. So he's right in my ear. And he gets right up against Joe Frazier's ear. And he goes, I'm going to whoop you, Joe Frazier. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe what I just heard, you know. Man, that is <laughs> amazing that's amazing and in regards to myself musically if someone that i would love to meet I, i've seen him and her perform before but just to meet them and talk to them i would love to uh even uh, uh interview or talk to jay-z and uh beyonce i would well, man that would be crazy yeah i mean you talk about legendary performers man and they've broken the records of a lot of a lot of artists in terms of record sales and concert tickets and con you know making money in concerts i mean that's how artists make their living now anymore and that's with concerts right i mean uh, <clears throat> yeah that's the that's the cream of the crop in that genre for sure yeah most definitely so i'm definitely interested in in regards to this so you're already doing your thing at kc95 how did you get presented the opportunity to become the pa announcer for the cardinals well, 
this was uh, okay. Let's go back to 1982. Um, the radio station needed somebody to do sports in the morning. I was doing the 10 to three shift middays and it was just one news and sports cast in the morning. Cause news and sports wasn't emphasized on a rock station back then. You know, it's just something you had to do for your station license to be, you know, uh, renewed every year. <clears throat> and they said, Hey, we need somebody to do news and sports. And I thought to myself, sports, well, that's why I got in this business. I'll go ahead and do that. And I also was thinking, you know, can I get a press pass and I can go down to Cardinal games, <clears throat> football and baseball at the time, and St. Louis Blues games for free with my press pass. So sure enough, I got the press pass in 82. I started covering the Cardinals for the radio station at my leisure. I mean, they didn't make me, you know, go to all the games or whatever. I just started doing it myself. And I'll be damned if they're not good in 1982. And I'll be darned if that amount right. They're not going to go to the playoffs and the World Series. And the station was all excited about it. St. Louis was so excited because we hadn't been to the World Series in 68 when they lost the World Series to the Detroit Tigers. And they said, hey, uh, we'll, we'll pay for you to cover the Cardinals. Just call in reports on the phone every day. And, you know, uh, would you want to do that? And I said, yeah. So next thing I know, I'm on the Cardinals charter flight to Atlanta for the playoffs, sitting right next to Stan Musial and his wife, Lil. And, and then, uh, you know, the Cardinals had to go to the World Series, and I go to Milwaukee, and they win the World Series. And in the offseason, for whatever reason, they changed PA announcers. I don't know if they fired Joel Myers, who the guy, the guy who replaced me at KZK, I remember. I don't know if they fired him for some reason or he quit. I, I don't remember exactly what happened. But uh, they asked me if, uh, since I got to know some of the folks down there, they asked me if I wanted to audition for it. And I, I did, and that's how I got the job. But if I wouldn't have made that little, you know, what seemed like an unimportant decision to do that news and sports cast that morning in the mornings on Casey, I never would have been in line to, to get that opportunity, you know? So you just never know when a little decision here or there can end up going a long way for you, you know? Right. And our favorite fan is, is back. Uh, Miss Williams. She is a comment that she listens to you every morning <laughs> on Casey. Hi, Alice. Is it Alice? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me get my glasses on here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Alice. Yep, so she's a huge fan, and uh, I'm not sure if she was logged in at the time when you brought up uh, meeting some of the members of the Beatles, and that's one of her favorite groups as well, along as, uh, her, as well as her son's favorite group as well back in the day. Yeah. So you to be able to meet, you know, Paul McCartney yep. and – be able to you know speak to other guy from the Beatles. I know that to her means a lot to her to hear you say that. Yeah, yeah, I didn't get a chance to meet him in person, but I did talk to him on the phone. That was that's as close yeah. as I got to him. But yeah, just to be able to say you spoke to you know a Beatle is uh, it's uh, to me it was it was an accomplishment. You know, pretty exciting stuff for me. So yep. yeah, this is a question I just thought of, but like I like to collect records. Do you have a nice record collection? I mean. I feel yeah. like you should. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I mean, back in the seventies, especially, I got a lot of stuff from the seventies and the in the eighties because back then, you know, uh, again, radio was the only way really that artists were able to get their music played and heard so they could sell records. So the record company people, the reps, would come in all the time to the radio station, and they'd bring us albums to to listen to because. Also, back in the 70s at Casey, it was free-form radio. So jocks on the air got to pick what they wanted to play, you know. So the record company guys would come to us, and they'd give us free copies of, of the albums. And I still have all, just about everything that was ever given to me. They're all promotional copies of, uh, of a lot of these albums. And most of them have never been listened to because, you know, I didn't have to listen to them here at home. I, I, I worked at the radio station. You know, I, I played what I wanted. That was that was where I played my music. So, yeah, I, I have a lot of stuff from the 70s and the 80s and, and some beyond that, but uh, mostly that time period, you know. And that was the, pretty much the heyday of, of FM rock radio, you know. Yeah, about 3,000 awesome. 3, albums. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Yeah, my yeah, mind's yeah. like 30, so you're a little bit ahead of me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, well, you know, and, and there have been temptations to sell because uh, – a lot of the guys I know, jocks that I know over the years, they've all sold their album collections. You know, they, because because albums were, you know, 
in, in the minds of many people like 10 years ago finished and done with as an art form so might as well get rid of them you know well uh, obviously vinyl has come back here recently and so uh <coughs> I'm, I'm glad i held on to uh to everything i have I, and i mostly held on to them for the artwork you know and mm -hmm. these album covers you know i just love some of that stuff and i love holding the album and and taking out the inside liner and reading the liner notes <coughs> Excuse me. All right, and we're sorry about that, everyone. Right now, yeah. he, he is from a cold, so please forgive him and forgive us if you're hearing the coughing, listening on the radio or watching uh, right now. So we do have, once again, the, the I legendary. I swear I'm not dying. <laughs> it sounds worse than it is. I'm over it, but it's just lingering, you know. Mm-hmm. I definitely understand a lot of people are going through the colds and the flu right now. So we're just praying for everyone who's going through uh, any type of uh, sickness right now because we know it's that season. So just want you to get well, be better for it, get ready for the upcoming season <laughs> coming yeah. up here <laughs> yeah. in a few months. Uh, let's see. Miss Williams says that she has a substantial vinyl collection. Don't think it's uh, 3,000, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hang on to them. Especially if they're in good shape, you know, uh, if, if uh, I'm not a record collector, but I know uh, some aspects of, of what record collectors look for when it comes to the albums. And you want to keep them in pristine condition if you can. You know, moving them around a lot is not a good idea because those covers get scratched up very easily. You get to like, like the ringer, the ringing of the album will kind mm -hmm. of start to come through onto the onto the uh, cover and. You know, like that, that, a little bit of wear and tear can kind of reduce the value of what you might have. But I believe someday some of these albums from the 70s and 80s, even though I sold in some cases millions of copies of them, a lot of people have not taken care of their albums, you know. Right. So something that I've been dying to ask you, <clears throat> you can just give us a behind the scenes of a normal day in the life of the you man from in the morning time working at kc95 and let's say if you have a game at 6 45 at bush stadium just kind of give us a rundown of of your day okay uh w well uh you know i get up in the morning and i and i go in to do the morning show and um um now i don't have to be in until seven i, I work the, the show from seven to ten but for many many years <coughs> a good 30 35 years or so, um, I was getting up at five o'clock in the morning to be there at six. And, and, uh, yeah, so the, that was, it was a tough time because I wouldn't get much sleep when the Cardinals were in town for like a 10 game home stay or something, you know, but I always persevered through it. I always looked at the season as kind of like a mountain to climb and, and, uh, every year, you know, I, my, it was, it was my intention to make every game. And, uh, that, that's what I pretty much has have done. So, Anyway, yeah, I get up early in the morning, do the radio show. Um, uh, after the radio show's over, often I'll have to do some recordings for some of the specialty shows I do on Sundays, uh, take some commercials sometimes for clients, meet with advertisers. And uh, I'll be finished by about uh, usually right around noonish, around that time. And uh, when the Cardinals are in town, I'll go home and I'll, I'll take a nap on some days, most days. And then I'll, I'll get up and uh, have to be at the stadium about an hour before the game starts, sometimes a little earlier than that, especially on the first days of home stands with new teams coming in. You know, you want to get there a little bit earlier and get the pronunciations of different players. And uh, and then I'll do the game. And, you know, the games these days last a lot longer than they used to back in the 80s. So I count on three hours at least for, for a ball game now. Uh, a lot of times it goes longer. And then uh, I'll get home get to bed as soon as I can and, uh, and do it all over the next day. But, um, yeah, when the, when Cardinals are in town, my, my, my schedule is full. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, my, my family knows that, uh, well, see when the Cardinals hired me back then, they, they said, uh, you know, we want somebody who's going to be there every day because we want fans to have the same ballpark experience every day when they come in the same voice, the same organ player, similar features on the, on the, on the, uh, video boards and stuff like that. And they want it to be, uh, uh, especially for season ticket holders, you know, they want it to be uh, consistent for them. And so I told them, Hey, you're hiring the right guy. Cause I'll come, I'll make every game. And in the 38 seasons that I've been there, I think I've missed five games 
over that whole period of time. <clears throat> so that's amazing. Cause now my next question was how many games have you missed over your uh, illustrious 38 years, but you just said seasons and then you just said it five yeah. games, 38 seasons. That is incredible. Are you talking about regular season game? You talking about postseason games, right? I mean, that is incredible. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Even my daughters, I have two, I have three daughters and two of them got married and they knew, uh, Got a schedule around the Cardinal homestand, so right. <laughs> Daddy, Daddy can't they, walk you out of aisle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he won't be there if you don't. So that's yeah. that's pretty amazing. Yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, when when's the last time you've had to even buy anything while you were at Bush Stadium? Because I'm pretty sure a man of your stature doesn't have to buy anything. <laughs> well, they do provide us with. Uh, you know, meals, the, the media, the media, the media gets meals. So we do get provided with the food there, but um, yeah, I really haven't bought anything down there. <laughs> uh, a lot of it looks good though. I mean, I'll tell you that much, you know, a lot of it looks real good, but uh, yeah, that, I mean that, and you know, like concert tickets, although you know, lately it's been harder to, to get concert tickets for free because they're so expensive anymore. But uh, for the longest time, I didn't buy concert tickets. I didn't buy albums. I didn't buy, you know, CDs or anything because we, they're provided for us at the station. So I've uh, I lived a lucky life in that regard, you know. <clears throat> that's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My tickets and nothing like that. So uh, I, I believe the broadcast is boot. No matter if it's cold or hot, you have that open air. Is that correct? Well, yeah, we do have a window that's open and I sit right next to that open window. So Sometimes, you know, those cold, chilly nights, the wind can blow in there and I can get a little cold. But for the most part, it's it's comfortable. You know, it's, we're, we're in, a, in a room where we've got air conditioning, you know, we've got, we got heat if we need it. So, But I'm in a big room now. It used to be at, at Bush Stadium 2. I was in a little area with the organ player, Ernie Hayes, for a long time. <clears throat> and um, But now I'm in a room with, I guess, there's probably 50 people in there. And we're all we're all in that same room. It's the scoreboard operators, uh, uh, producer, director, uh, the organist, the guy who plays the recorded music, uh, the guys who run the uh, ribbon boards, uh, the, the scoreboard, uh, all, all the different technical aspects, the editors. I mean, they're busy up there, you know, especially in between innings when uh, when that's when that's when it's time for the uh, scoreboard operation team to shine, you know. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's it's become so much more complicated and uh, intricate and uh, intense down there to entertain the fans uh, because you know everywhere you go in these in stadiums all around the country now man entertaining the fans is a is a big deal and uh, you know you got advertisement in there uh, you know, the, the, the sponsors spend a lot of money on their stuff running on the on the video boards in between innings and you got to make sure you get all that right and uh, it's it's quite the operation uh, some you know, get in touch with me, and I'll uh, take you guys up there someday. You can check it out. <laughs> Say no more. We are mm. definitely there. Say no more. Go ahead. Um, go. I was just gonna say you talking about you know trying to keep the fans um you know tuned in to what's yeah. going on at the stadium. We've talked about it a couple of times here on the platform show, but is, do you have any like would what what do you think would keep younger fans more entertained at the stadium because i know like we've talked about here our other host of uh, bunny she mentions you know sometimes sitting at the ballpark it can get kind of boring you know is there yeah. like a, a, a not an artist you know like that that would be kind of weird for an artist to come in but you know how like uh timmy trumpet came in at the mets game for uh edwin diaz you know do you think yeah. there's anything like that that major league stadiums could do to keep the younger fans intrigued for Boy, that's a good question. You know, uh, I think first of all, Major League Baseball is going to do something here this upcoming season that's going to help all fans stay more engaged and hopefully younger fans too. And that's the pitch clock. And they say it's worked really well in the minor leagues, and it's cut like 25 minutes off of games, 25 to 30 minutes off games. And that's always been my my one of my concerns about the game that the slowness. And, and how much downtime there is in between pitches and the players play the game so much slower today than they used to. And this is going to pick up the action. And I think that's going to, going to help. And I'm interested to see how it all works out. And it's going to be 
challenging for all of us. Those of us up in our in a room too, though the guys who who uh, play the sound bites in between the the pitches, you know, they got to be quicker. They have to get their stuff in and out real fast, and and um, you know, uh, uh, I think that'll go a long way in, in just keeping all fans engaged. But as far as young people, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think I think young people uh, like the game, and I think they're going to be. You know, they're being taught the game by, by fathers and mothers <clears throat> and aunts and uncles and grandparents. And it's not a game. It's different than all the other games. <clears throat> and that it's, it's uh, you know, it's not about trying to put the ball in the other team's goal. We've got enough games like that. You know, this is a completely different game. It's, it's uh, interesting. There are so many aspects to it. And, and each player has to be able to do so many different things, you know, offense, defense, Run the bases. Every there's just you know, there's a lot to being a baseball player. That that uh, it's more. I don't. I think other sports not, not, maybe not necessarily. Uh, you have to be quite as uh, dynamic of an athlete. I think. I don't know. I could be wrong about that. I mean, basketball players are tremendous athletes, and and, and uh, hockey players have their skills, and soccer players are great athletes. But as far as their sport goes, I don't know if they're all doing as much as a a baseball player has to do who starts in the field every day. And then you're doing 162 games on top. You know. So I don't know, I probably over answered your question, but I think young people are I think young kids are they, they, I think baseball's got a good future. I really do. I, I definitely think it has a bright future with a lot of the young talent that's been yeah, you know, coming up the last couple of years, the Tatis Juniors, the Julio Rodriguez, the yeah, Jordan, and the you know. yeah, and you know the Cardinals got a great young player coming up here. We're going to see him this year, I'll bet you, uh, a lot, and that's uh, Jordan Walker. Mm-hmm. And they, they say this guy is off the charts good, and I can't wait right. to be a great Cardinal. And and uh, you know, who, who knows what his, you know, he could be the next Albert Pujols, you know. And you brought up kids earlier. I'm pretty sure kids uh, would definitely love to experience something like this even more. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's one of the coolest things. So with kids going to the, the booth and joining you and making announcements in regards to who's up to bat, et cetera, has there been uh, kids, a kid or kids that had uh, certain moments you'd be like, oh, let me get the mic away from the mic, uh, the mic excuse me, I said microwave, that microphone from you because you might say the wrong thing or have you had any uh, any interesting moments with kids talking on the microphone? Oh, uh, you know, they're just, they're, they're all different and it's, it's I, I'm always uh, intrigued as to what, what is going to happen that particular night. What You know, because uh, they're, they're surprised. I mean, they don't come to the stadium knowing they're going to do this. Uh, mm. Somebody from the uh, uh, Fred Team Fredbird well, just find a kid, you know, walking in the uh, concourse with a parent. <clears throat> and uh, they'll ask them if they want to come and be the stadium PA announcer for a half inning. And so they come in. Some of them are scared, scared to death. And then others come in and they are just full of confidence and have no fear and just knock it out of the park. And it's it's pretty amazing. You know, they'll, they'll uh, scream into the microphone, you know, and get all excited. And then other ones... You, you got to turn the microphone up so loud you can barely hear them. You know they're so they're so afraid. <laughs> so just that whole experience has been exciting and fun. We had one guy. It, it was you know it's not just for kids. Uh, they do have occasion. They used to. It's been kids mostly lately. But when they first started the process, the the the, the uh, feature, uh, adults could do it too. And we had uh, one person was so excited they had their arms full of stuff they bought at the concession stand, and she ran down the steps into our area in that open window I was telling you about. She in, in she threw her stuff down, thinking I guess the window was closed, and all her stuff went right out the window down into the oh seats below. <laughs> yeah, and oh. uh, yeah, she she had no idea. She was so excited that there was an open window there and lost all her stuff. But uh, yeah, I like it with with the kids better than the adults because you know, I mean, the kids just had a special it's just something about them. You know, they're so excited and cute when they're up there. And see, I know how I am. So if I would have had the opportunity, kid or adult, let's say Pujols up the bat, I would have been like, Albert Pujols. <laughs> you know, so I, I just would have been 
getting everyone going, laughing, and probably even had the players <laughs> themselves probably <laughs> have a little laugh because that's just how I am. I, I want to be different. I want yeah. to be like Albert food host. I want to be like, I, I want to be like, it's y'all boy, y'all here, you know, something like yeah. that. Yeah, Melina. Right, so, right. I would well, you love know, to have the opportunity to do that. You know what? I mean, I think that's it's probably going in that direction. You know, I mean, I'm one of the old school guys. You know, I mean, I give it a little extra when when Albert Pujols come, uh, came up to the plate. You know, but uh, um, yeah, you know, you when you go to football games now and you hear the PA announcers uh, yelling into the microphone, third down. You know, and and they're in, they're getting into it. I I think baseball is probably heading in that same direction someday. We're going to have a lot of screaming and yelling from the PA announcers, but uh, I don't think I can do that now anymore because it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be me, you know, it wouldn't be right for a long time, you know, it'd have to be somebody like you who comes in new or, or, you know, like you say, comes in for a half inning or whatever, do it. The kids will do that once in a while, you know, some of the kids will come in and they'll get all excited like that. And, and that's cool, you know, but uh, yeah, for me, it, it's kind of out of character, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I would definitely <laughs> eat that up. Like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. But I think um, that's where it's going, though. I really do. I think, you know, uh, any way to get the fans into it and make noise, that's what they're interested in, you know, up in that room. So we all know that one of your jobs as a PA announcer, not just being in the booth, but also being on the field every game. Uh, <laughs> was there a moment that you – when you first started off, you were nervous being in front of 40 something thousand people that's looking right at you at the beginning of the game. Um, let's see, was I ever nervous about that? Uh, I guess maybe at the very beginning I was, but I don't remember it really. Now, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not, I'm not at, 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 at all, except, uh, I mean, once in a while we'll have a ceremony where I know that I'm on either network television or, or on Valley Sports Midwest live you know they're covering the ceremony itself and i won't want to mess up you know so uh i might get a little bit of butterflies in those situations but um like when the cardinals go to the world series i mean at least they have at least last time i did them uh they say and now let's go to pa announcer john Eulett at bush stadium in st louis and right i'll announce all the players out of the dugout and make uh you know announce the national anthem uh first pitch uh any kind of ceremony and it's all live on network television, you know? So those moments can be a little, uh, you know, I get a little nervous maybe for those, but on any other regular game, but now anymore, you know, it's just, it's just pretty, pretty, uh, normal. So have you like yourself, have you yourself had an embarrassing moment that you uh, are able yeah. to tell? Of? Yeah, <clears throat> there have been a few. Uh, let's see. Well, you know, the Cardinals have been doing this thing for a little while now. Uh, the farmers, the characters for the Missouri Farmer Association will, will right, race the right. stadium. And, uh, Captain Cornelius is one of the characters, and uh, uh, Benny the Bull, and uh, Sweet it's Bessie. Pig. Sweet Bessie, yeah. huh? So, yeah, I'm about to say 95 pig or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so they want me to do play by play of the race. And one of the first times we did it, you know, trying to keep the name straight, and they're going around the warning track, and I referred to uh, Captain Cornelius accidentally as Cornholio. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> from beavis and butthead fame and uh cornholio and the <laughs> the uh advertiser wasn't too happy about it so never did that again and, and then uh, there was one time early on when i was doing the doing a game against the montreal expos i remember and <clears throat> the engineer who sat next to me in the room at the time, guy who ran the control panel that we had, uh, you know, it was an old old setup back then. But anyway, uh, he was talking to me, and I kind of got side sidetracked, and I announced the player's name, and <clears throat> I looked. He, I noticed the player kind of looked up, and but I, you know, I didn't give much attention, and I announced the next guy who came up, and he kind of looked up, and I thought, well, that's kind of weird. 
and I announced the next guy, and then the umpire stepped back, and then he kind of looked up towards the press box, and then uh, uh, announced the next guy, and then uh, somebody got my attention. Hey, you're a batter behind. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I went like five players in a five bat- batters in a row with the wrong name, and uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, there was a time when, uh, remember Rafael Palmero by any chance? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, there was another Palmero. So it was Rafael Palmero, and then there was, you know, by any chance, what I'm referring to is another Palmero. <laughs> See, I didn't anyway, find that book. Uh, the Cardinals had uh, one of the Palmeros, and I accidentally said, Announced him as the other more well known pal. <laughs> and so I felt bad about it. I think I might have done it twice. And so I felt bad about it. And I was down on the field one day and he came out on the field and I said, Man, I gotta apologize to you for, for mis you know, getting you mixed up with the other guy. And he goes, Ah, oh, don't worry about it, you know. And as he was walking away, he says, You just don't expect it at home. So <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, the only other Palmero I see is a Preston Palmero, but I'm not sure that's the same one or not. Yeah, no. Two of them, I can't remember now. And then uh, lately, for whatever reason, I keep wanting to call Brendan Donovan Donovan Osborne. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, did, I did it once in a game, but the crowd was real loud. I don't think anybody heard it. And then I did it one time when he was, he was our catcher for some first pitches before a game and I did it then not that it really mattered then uh he was standing right behind me when I did it that time and he kind of looked over at me and I went ah shit (laughs) (laughs) but I I don't know why but I gotta I gotta keep from calling him Donovan Osborne for some reason it's Brendan Donovan Mm. so as you see here you have a picture of you at the old Bush Stadium looking looking pretty fly and 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 recently uh at Bush Stadium uh, with the uh comedian, I, I forget his name, uh, Chris you, Red. You, there, there we go. Uh, just just amazing the opportunity that you get to have to you know meet so many uh people and like even this picture right here being with the Hall of Famers. You know, you yeah. got Biss Coleman, you know, Big Mac right there. I believe uh-huh. that was Mike Shannon and just so many other guys who you met over the years. Uh, what would you say over your you over your time at Bush Stadium has probably been like your most uh maybe memorable time or times? Well, uh before I answer that question, let me comment on those photos that you just sh- showed there. Uh, uh the the one on the on one side, I was wearing a, a suit and tie. I mean a, a jacket and, and tie. That's how I used to have to dress up for the games. Wow. <laughs> Cause I was going down on the field. They used to make me you know dress up like that. And then uh, you know things got relaxed as years went on, and so uh, yeah, there, there, that's the different big difference from what it used to be. And it, even some of those games like that on that uh, in that stadium there, the turf you know was, it could have been could have been a hundred degrees out there that day, and I had dressed like that, you know. And then uh, the other photo you showed with Vince Coleman. Vince Coleman and I were great friends when he when he came to the team. First time he ever played golf, I'm pretty sure, it was with me at a golf course down in South County. And from that day on, from that time on, Vince Coleman became so addicted to golf. And that's all he and I ever talk about whenever we see each other anymore about our golf games. But he, he, was, he, was, he was such a, a wonderful person. I really enjoyed Vince. Uh, but uh, as far as um, my most exciting moments down at Bush Stadium, game six of the 2011 World Series, my gosh, I mean, I, I, my, my, I still to this day, just shake my head and can't believe I saw what I saw that night, you know, uh, when, when the Cardinals were down to their final strike in the ninth inning and David Freeze, the hometown kid, hits that ball over Nelson Cruz's head in right field and they tie the game up. And then they go down by two again on that home run by Hamilton in the uh, top of the 10th, in the bottom of the 10th, down to their last strike again. And Lance Berkman, comes up and gets that base hit and ties the game again. And then the hometown kid comes up again in the 11th and sends us all home with that home run. 
I, I mean, I remember leaving the stadium. My fault, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Olivia, was on the phone talking to me. I said, honey, I can't believe what I just saw. I don't think, I, I know there will be nothing that will top this ever again in, in my career with the St. Louis Cardinals. It was such an amazing, amazing night. <clears throat> How hard was it for you to maintain your emotions when you <laughs> see stuff, stuff like that in person? Well, I mean, you know, I'm not doing play-by-play, play, so, you know, right. uh, it wasn't something where I had to contain myself and uh, to keep from embarrassing myself on, on the microphone. But in the room there, we were just pounding on each other and just, uh, you know, we, did, we didn't hold back. We, we just, because a lot of the people there have been there a long time with me. And, you know, we, to, to see what happened there that night, was it was just a miracle. And if it would have been the New York Yankees, if we were the Yankees, that game would be considered the greatest game in the history of Major League Baseball. But because it didn't happen in St. Louis and it's not a major media town, it uh, it's still great, but it doesn't get near the attention it should because I can't, I just can't remember a World Series game any better than that one. Totally agree. Yes, uh, definitely. I, I still remember I was acting like an idiot whenever that happened, yeah. <laughs> jumping up and down and screaming. And, yeah, well, yeah, and that's that's in our, in our scoreboard group, uh, scoreboard team. They asked people to send their video in that videos in of people experiencing that by while watching the game on TV. And it, I, they put together a tremendous montage of St. Louis fans what they you know watching that game live and their reactions it is hilarious and and at the same time emotional you know you get so emotional watching it yeah that's that's what sports do though you know yeah. <laughs> i feel like especially baseball i don't know baseball's frank and tell baseball's my sport it's beautiful i love everything about it and it's like yeah i get emotional whenever i think of that type of stuff yeah oh tell us too tell us about this night right here Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> you know, we uh, we would bring him to the plate with uh, the Guns N' Roses song, uh, Welcome to the Jungle. And he didn't pick that. It was just one uh, that my boss and I, Tony Simakaitis, we were just thinking of songs to play for these players when they came up to the plate. Because back then, I was also playing the music and doing the PA at the same time. So I was handling two jobs at one time. And uh, he just said, what do, you, what do you think about this? Welcome to the jungle. Like, eh, that's, that's fine. Let's, let's just go ahead and go with that one. Having no idea that someday it was going to become a very important part of his coming to the plate and, and, and fans' experience of him coming to the plate. They'd hear that, that song start to build, and they knew that Mark McGuire was coming to the plate. And he never cared about what song was being played. He never asked for that or anything. It was not important to him. And so, uh, you know... Uh, when he came to the plate, it was always exciting. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, uh, when that moment happened, it was uh, when we hit 62, that ball went over the wall so fast out in left field, it barely cleared the wall. And it was it was that quick and it was over. Uh, that the whole season, the whole buildup to that season was, and it was the first time we'd ever seen anything like that in, in you know, decades. Uh, up until recently here with Pujols chasing 700 and, and uh, Judge, Aaron Judge, uh, uh, breaking the American League record. You know how exciting you know that, that was this year, too. So that was on the heels of what Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were doing back then, you know. And so it was the first time that anything like that had happened in baseball for a long time. That And it was a, that vaunted record of that home run record. So it was a special moment. And... Uh, I was glad to be a part of it, the small, you know, small role that I had in announcing him to the plate. And the same with Pujols, you know, bringing Albert to the plate in those key moments, especially now when everybody's got video cameras rolling and everything. You, you know, you know how, you know, your voice is going to be connected uh, to, to some, some great Cardinal moments. And it just makes me really proud to be part of all of them, you know, over these years, starting in 1983. And, you know, as as you were talking, I'm looking at this photo, just kind of like we live in that that moment, because I remember watching the TV, watching the the, the game. Uh, yeah. Doing that. moment. <clears throat> but I see this cameraman. He kind of reminds me of Kevin Durant. <laughs> he does kind of look like him. <laughs> yeah. You know, you look at when you look at old photos of baseball back in the 1930s and 40s. 
the cameramen were on the field when they were pitching mm. balls. They were off to the right or to the left of the of the plate taking pictures. You know. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, you know, and, and sometimes you think, well, what's that cameraman doing there? With you know, that, that, that's he's he's out of place. But that's been going on for decades and decades in Major League Baseball. And it's funny how you brought that up because uh, I recall that one crazy night in which uh, Juan Encarnacion got hit in the eye. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and never came back. You know, to baseball again. I know that had to be such a scary moment to see. Yeah, that uh, you know, I'm surprised that hasn't happened more often. I'm right, you, and it's just some of those guys stand in in positions. You'd think they know better. They're major league players, and and they'll stand in spots where I'm like, man, I wouldn't stand there. You paid me a a million dollars, uh, but yeah, it was it was sad to see that his career was ended by that. You know, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, injuries. That's why I think these guys deserve the money they get, man. I mean, uh, all athletes at all levels of all sports, because it can be over in a blink of an eye, and they, no you know, pun, no, no pun intended. huh? Yeah, no, no pun, pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's messed up. <laughs> well, that's, we were kind of talking about that earlier, though, when Miss Williams said something, you know, like. Winning a World Series isn't guaranteed, but at least, you know, the money's guaranteed. You know, some of these guys, they might, you know, they might pull a hammy or something and have consistent injuries all the time or, you know, something like that happened to him. You know, at least he's got the money to fall back on to. Yeah, yeah, there's there's that for sure. But, uh, you know, there's, the, the, there's all kinds of people who didn't make it to the major leagues when they probably had the – the talent to do it because of some injury that, that caught him in the minor leagues. And that was it, you know? So, yeah, I mean, you see the money that, that they're making in sports today <clears throat> and um, it's all relative to, you know, when, when Babe Ruth and Stan Musial and Hank Aaron and those guys were doing what they were doing. We look back on it and go, so, well, they weren't making any money, but for their time, that was a lot of money. I mean, when Stan Musial right. was the first man to make a hundred thousand dollars back in, 64 whatever 60 whatever that was in the 60s that was a ton of money back then you know it was shocking i think ozzy was ozzy smith the first million dollar player or the first two million dollar player something like that i remember thinking how how how, how outrageous and incredible that was but you know for that time it was just as much as you know 20 000, 20 million a year is now yeah, now I guarantee next year we'll be talking about uh, Shohei making probably five hundred million. Honestly, you know, yeah. like we're like mind blown at three fifty to three sixty, but yeah, one hundred percent going to at least make five hundred, like at least. Well, yeah, and you know, this day and age too, now with the internet and social media and everything, the the stream and gambling, you know, the way, how that's legal now in a lot of states and uh, on the internet. I mean, there's so much more money being poured into the game. These guys deserve their 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 cut of it, you know. I mean, back when uh, Ozzy Smith was making two million dollars, there were three streams of revenue, I guess. You know, tickets, uh, concession, and uh, selling merchandise. Oh, and maybe parking. So four. Now, I mean, it's those four plus, you know, the the internet and uh, uh, social media money that comes in from from uh, Apple TV and uh, you know just all kinds of different ways that money's being poured into into professional sports. Uh, these clubs are making a lot of money and the players deserve their cut. Mm. Yeah. And then that was back in the day when gas was like 95 cents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Definitely missed those days. So yeah. uh, this, this picture I'm on the show now, I know that it's going to definitely mean a whole lot to you. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. I got that hanging up in my office here at the house. Uh, with Jack Buck, and I got him to sign it. And then what he wrote on there, I couldn't believe it when I saw when I when I looked at it. He wrote, "Nice to work with you." Now I never considered myself actually working with Jack Buck because you know he was on the in the radio side, and I was with the PA announcer, and we we really weren't necessarily working together. But if he says we did, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Let's believe it. And then yeah. to and then now seeing what Joe Buck is doing with his career. Uh, yeah. Well, first, before I even get to that, 
uh, 9-11, when Jack Buck had that incredible speech, you know, prior to the game, uh, I know it wasn't a dry eye in the in, in the uh, in the stadium that yeah. night. Can you kind of take us through that real quick? Yeah, you know, uh, baseball had shut down following 9-11. Uh, it was the greatest tragedy to hit our country since, in my opinion, the assassination of of uh, John Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. And I was a little kid when those things happened and they were just shocking events that hit your soul to the core. And, and this was the first time that I felt that same thing I felt when I was a kid, uh, when, when 9-11 happened, that same sadness that came over me. And so, yeah, for Jack Buck to, to have that as, the first game back from Major League Baseball and to have him say what he said, uh, you know, you're right. It was quite emotional and, and uh, it, it helped the country, I think, get kind of get some legs back underneath it so we could, we could move on and, and try to deal with whatever was yet to come in our future. You know, it was in its comforting voices like, like Jack Buck had that I think is what made him valuable and, and, and worth, uh, whatever it was he, he made in his career, you know, he, he, uh, he filled a, a role that uh, not many people can fill, you know, some of those, those great voices of the past, you know, Jack Buck certainly had one of those and he was, what a, what a broadcaster that guy was, man. And as I said earlier, not just as a, as a baseball play by play guy, but uh, just as someone who would just speak extempore extemporaneously off the top of his head and, and be funny and entertaining at at uh, dinner events, you know these these uh, banquets that he would host. Uh, he was just tremendous at, at what he did. And every once in a while, I'll hear back a tape of him because you know after a while the voice is gone. You know you don't hear that voice anymore. And then somebody will play it for some whatever reason, and they go, and I go, damn, that dude was good. And, it, and what he did holds up to this day. You know. <clears throat> And then, as you saw before, the picture of you and Joe Buck. So just talk about the career that he's had and uh, what he's done for St. Yeah. Louis and what he's done now nationally. Well, Joe was, I think, 13 years old, and he came into our PA booth back uh, when I was back in the in the eight, early 80s and mid-80s. And he had his high school or his junior high school buddies with him. And, hey, can we come down and sit in your booth with you, you know? Yeah, come on down, Joe, and you know, I'd talk to him, and and uh, they were they were smart sports fans back then. I remember talking to them; they knew their stuff, you know, and didn't know what Joe wanted to do at that particular time. But I think back of him as a thirteen-year-old kid, and, you know, just excited to be around the stadium with his dad and coming down the PA booth, and then what where his career went, and I mean. Like that day that of that picture, I mean, I didn't see him at first. He came up from behind me and he, he grabbed me and he grabbed, then you know, I turned around, he grabbed me by the cheeks and he was, you know, shaking my head back and forth. And, you know, he's, he's always been kind and nice and uh, I'm just so happy for him, you know. <clears throat> yeah, such an incredible career. And, you know, he can always represent St. Louis and yeah, just so many great things for yeah. uh, and he yeah. went to the top and he and he got to the top and he was he was sensitive of people saying oh you got there because of your dad but then when right. he got and, and and i'm sure it didn't hurt but when he did get there and he got to the top the dude was good i mean he was just as solid as can be i think and uh you know i know there are some people who don't who think oh he, oh he's two-sided this way or the other that as a matter of fact, I think a lot of times he would go overboard and not be uh, pro Cardinal in some national games that feature the Cardinals because he he you knew he would be he was sensitive to people you know being critical of him in that regard. But I always thought he tried to play fair and square down the middle all the time. I never sensed that Joe Buck was side with one team or the other. <laughs> and I and I kind of know him, you know. <laughs> so of course. You can't go on even further without mentioning this moment right here and the season that they just had. Yachty, yeah. Wayno, who holds. How special was it to go through that, go through this past season with those three incredible players? Well, it started for me uh, opening day 
when I introduced them and I had bring them out onto the field for pregame ceremonies. And I was reading the copy for Pujols and I almost started crying. And uh, I was able to collect myself and, and get through it. And this was live on you know television. And I caught, I said, oh my God, you're going to, you're going to blow this. And I was able to not cry, but I started to feel it welling up in me, you know, because uh, he's the greatest player I ever saw uh, in a Cardinal uniform. He and Ozzie Smith. <clears throat> and uh, then I said, oh my gosh, I still got to read the Molina copy. That was coming up, <laughs> you know, uh, a few introductions, a few, few, few players further down the line. And, uh, I got through that one too, but, my, but for me, emotionally, it was that first night. I, I, I knew that I was seeing something and being a small, had a small role and being a part of something that the fans were going to experience. My voice is going to be connected to it. And, uh, it, uh, yeah, it touches you, you know, it, it uh, I, I'm the older I get, the more emotional I get on different things, you know? <clears throat> um, so I got to be on guard for that because people don't want to PA announcer, going and now ladies and gentlemen Al <laughs> <laughs> that ain't gonna come off good <laughs> hey like wait a minute is this man crying <laughs> <laughs> yeah it definitely was an incredible season a lot of great moments uh, i know that you know st louis selfishly would have loved to experience who was hitting 700 in bush stadium yeah. I, oh, yeah. We, that was. I was with my family. We were on vacation in Colorado <clears throat> when it happened, and uh, yeah, I thought to myself, "Yeah, it sure would have been a lot more fun at Bush Stadium that day if it would have happened there." But uh, hey, what are you going to do? I mean, how about like the Cardinals announcers? You know, the radio and TV announcers. You know, those guys right. follow the follow the guy all year long, waiting for that big moment, and it doesn't even you know <clears throat> happen for him. Like, well, it happened for John Rooney on. on on the radio side because he was he was there but the tv side they didn't get to announce it because it was a national television or no it was apple tv that right. got, they got that game a lot of cardinal fans didn't even get to see it live correct yeah that was it was pretty right uh, pretty uh, ironic that who host would do it <laughs> it would hit two home runs yeah that night you probably thought okay maybe one friday then you can go ahead and do it when you know, uh, yeah. the broadcast would have been on for real, but you know, it is what it is. But it was definitely a great moment and uh, a great right. season. Also, just uh, yeah, the, the I think I saw today, last year. I think I saw today MLB, uh, at least on Twitter, I saw MLB announced that as number the, one, yeah, number one play of the year. Yeah, that 700 home. So something that I also want to discuss before uh, we end this wonderful interview uh, was that transition from Bush Stadium 2 to Bush Stadium 3. So as you see here, yeah, a picture of the new of the current stadium, Bush Stadium 3, uh, getting built while you're still playing a full season at Bush Stadium 2. Were there any concerns inside? that after the very last out, after the Cardinals played the Astros, that they wasn't going to be able to build the Bush Stadium 3 in time before the new season started? Uh, yeah, I think there was some concern that they – well, they didn't have it completely finished as it turned out. but uh, Exactly. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, there was a little bit of concern about that. For, 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 for us <clears throat> working there, you know – even though Bush Stadium 2 still looked pretty, you know, from the outside and stuff, internally it was it was uh, it was it was struggling, you know, and so uh, like for us as far as equipment and all the stuff that was going to come in the new stadium, we were all excited for that, you know, we were ready for it because, you know, like I say, you know, the things things were getting pretty crickety and old inside uh, uh, Bush too, so we were excited for it and. Uh, we, I, I personally, I welcomed it with open arms. I, I was, I was ready for it. I was excited for it. And uh, the only negative thing is it took my parking spot. But other than that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as you see right here, this is probably like yeah. around, uh, definitely in the winter time uh, when this was going on right here. Uh -huh. 
one stadium is going down, other stadiums getting built. And I'm like, how are they gonna get this done in between October and and pretty much what uh um March? Yeah, I know. But, but they they did it, and you know, I know that the left field wasn't ready yet. I think they had like the whole left field uh upper deck section not even used yet because yes. you know they're still, still working on things, whatever. But it was pretty amazing how they were able to make that happen, especially during the Midwest, uh, St. Louis style winter, excuse me, winters that yeah. was going on during that time frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I I love walking. I feel like it's a second home for me, a home away from home when I walk in there now. And and uh, you know, we we'll do um, we do about 35 amateur games uh, during the season too. We high school and college games. We do them exactly the same way we do the Cardinal games. You know. I announce and we play the music and uh, video replay and walk up music and stuff for the kids. And, and uh, I just love sitting there sometimes when there aren't that many people in the, in the stands, even I just sit there and I just look around and I just feel comfortable. It feels like home. You know, it's a, I just love that place. Yeah. I, I guess it is home. So speaking of, of which, how have you been able to balance? Um, I know you said earlier, uh, to your kids, don't get married around baseball season because you know I can't be there. But just how have you been able to balance uh, <clears throat> life as a professional in regards to the radio, Carlos P announcer, and also being a, a husband and, and father? Oh gosh, um, well, my wife always she she was in the radio business uh, back in the eighties. So she understood the industry and what it took for someone like myself to uh, try to make it in that business and in that world. So she always understood. And then when we had our children, she uh, helped them understand that dad was, you know, busy. And back then, sometimes I traveled a, a decent amount for cover sports and other other trips at the station would send us on for broadcasts and things like that. So. Uh, you know, I, I give her all the credit to, to help, you know, when I'd come home in between doing the radio station. And back then I was doing six to 10 in the morning. And I also did the, the midday shift from 10 to two. So I only had a short little window for naps in the afternoon. And she'd make sure that the kids were either busy somewhere at the pool or at school. You know, they would be at school and she'd get, make sure that when they came home, they were quiet. So dad could take a nap and uh, she she's the one that made that all work, and uh, I'm all, I'm forever grateful. Because yeah, I'm sure that that had to be a huge you know sacrifice to do what you do, even though of course you're not like traveling on the road, but still, uh, you know, I yeah. know you said earlier working from six to seven in the morning to what eleven or so. Then let's say if they have a uh, a home game at noon or one o'clock. You have to be there at a certain time. Yeah, uh, you know, to, to be prepared for the game. So I know it took a took a whole lot of sacrifice from you to make that happen, and for your family to be able to, you know, be willing and okay for you to do what you do as well. Yeah, and then as my children got older and they then they realized, understood more about what dad was doing for a living. You know, uh, I could get them tickets to Cardinal games uh, occasionally, and they liked that. So. They, uh, they, they don't want me to retire from that job now, you know, as, as adult ch children. They, uh, not that I've ever thought about doing it because I, I think I'll do that for a long time as long as the Cardinals will have me. And, and uh, so, you know, uh, and then, uh, you know, I think occasionally they kind of benefit from our last name kind of being known in town. And uh, <laughs> they get a kick out of that once in a while, you know. We'll get a good seat at a restaurant or something or special dessert or something. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, Joe, did you have any uh, any more questions? Um, no, I mean, you kind of touched on everything. I was just going to ask, ask how, you know, just what the vibe was like, you know, all season with Albert's, you know, 700 chase there and just that last little ceremony that they had, you know, with Yachty and Albert and their families. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get to be a part of that ceremony. Uh, uh, Dan uh, McLaughlin, was able, he, he was doing that, but uh, it probably was a good thing that he did it because I don't think I'd have been able to hold it together. Like I told you in that opening day, and I was just reading the script there to introduce him on the field that, that, that night, I almost cracked up. So, you know, probably worked out for the best, but, uh, 
yeah, it was it was an emotional season, and I wish they could have obviously finished a little better. I mean, they did win a division title, so that's nothing to sneeze at. But uh, yeah, we were set for what could have been the most magical finish to any Cardinal season, rivaling the 2011 season if they'd have won the dang World Series with Albert Pujols and Yadier Molina there for their final year. That would have been just incredible, but not to be. Yeah, and I was, uh, me and my husband were there at the last uh, playoff game, and just, I was hoping and praying. I saw Yachty came up again in the ninth, you know, two outs, and I was just hoping and praying that, you know, he wasn't going to be the last out, but Thank God that you know he had a base hit, and then yeah. I was I was there at the game, ball my eyes out because you know like Fred mentioned, I I was a catcher. Yachty's just been one of those guys for me my entire life, and I don't know, it was just sad knowing that that was it for Yachty. He just he was just yeah, done. yeah. I know it is kind of hard to believe. I mean, yeah, since two thousand four, right? Yeah, twenty twenty two, man. A lot of young people who grew up, and that's the only catcher they knew for the St. Louis Cardinals, Yadier Molina. You know, not not just kid. Right? So how many years was that? 17 years? Mm-hmm. Right. Or, yeah. I mean, about ready to graduate from high school, some of them. The only catcher they knew. Yep. Tell us real quick, if you don't mind, about uh, the Cardinals Kids TV show and how much fun you enjoy doing that. Oh, okay, yeah. So <clears throat> Jim Veeman is the guy who writes it, produces it, videotapes it, edits it, everything. He's, he's amazing. And, uh, he, he's, he's the, he's the guy who gets all the credit and, uh, yeah, they, they just asked me to do it. Now the first, I guess, 15 years or so I did it. I just did it as, as myself, John Hewitt. And then one day he said, Hey, we, we want to make you a character. Uh, do you think you can maybe, uh, like act, act a little bit in some of these skits and, and uh, be PU, Professor U Man, and we'll give you some glasses and a white coat and, you know, have you do some kind of goofy experiments. And, and I said, well, give it a try. I mean, what the heck? You know, got nothing to lose. And so we did, and it, it worked. So, um, yeah, I, I had fun, look, fun doing it. Uh, I'm glad he t- came up with that and, and changed my whole. Uh, aspect of it because it makes it more challenging and it's made it more fun and exciting to do. And I look forward to doing it every year. And I guess we're going to do it another year. You know, you never know because you know you got to have sponsors without sponsors. You got, you don't have anything. So we've been lucky to have a good sponsor in Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital and some others, and uh, they keep bringing it back. So hopefully we'll have another season. Uh, In the media world, uh, well, locally in St. Louis, do you feel that Brad Thompson, is going to be like that next big local media store. I feel like he's just on on the rise over what he's done over the last few years now. I agree with you. I think he has done a heck of a job. He uh, he works with our our sister station in our group Hubbard Radio. Uh, in Hubbard Radio, we got the Point, WIL, the Arch, one hundred six point five, Casey, and one hundred one one hundred one point one ESPN. So he works for our our. Uh, other station there. I, so I see him all the time and I hear him often in his afternoon slot and he's just uh, quick witted and interesting and not afraid to give his opinion and funny. And I think you're right. I think that he is a uh, uh, guy who's destined to have a long career with the Cardinal organization in that role as either color guy or whatever, who knows, you know, I don't know. Most definitely, and we, we've had the privilege to have him on the show in the past as a special guest. Uh, we've had uh, Randy Carricker, Michelle Smallman, uh, uh, we've had uh, Ben Hoffman, Tom Ackerman. Ackerman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, what, what's the host? Uh, Anthony Stalter, we've had, mm-hmm. had him on the show as well. <laughs> so, we had a, a slew of great uh, media people, athletes, celebrities, etc., to be on the show over the last five years. So it's definitely been incredible and you are now officially on the list of incredible guests that we've had on our show. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, again, sorry for uh, missing out there early on. I'm embarrassed, but hopefully we got it done here tonight and uh, you know, we got the job. 
Yeah. Most definitely. Let's, let's do it again sometime. <laughs> Most we'll we'll make a deal out if you don't mind just staying on uh after we, we end the show just for a, a real quick post show talk. Uh but before we do that, did you have any last words, any anything that you want to just give any special love out to? Oh, you know, thanks to all the listeners of KC Radio who have been with us all these years. We have a very loyal and they, uh, they supported me thick and thin over 50, I mean, 46 years. And and uh, I, I just love them all. And, of course, uh, my family, I'm uh, very, very appreciative of my wife and my daughters for uh, just being good people. I love them. And one of them sitting right down here on the floor. So my youngest daughter, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I've seen some of the photos and I saw some great <laughs> She's a star now. She's on the platform. There you go. It's official. But no, I've definitely been seeing the photos of you and your family and you know, loving it. And once again, we appreciate you being on the show. Thanks again for taking some time out. No apologies needed. We understand. You know, life is life, but you're here. And we thank you very much. Once, if you don't mind just staying on real quick yeah. before we uh, end the stream. With okay. that being said, Joe, a very, very incredible interview. We was lucky to get him on. Uh, uh, we was actually, people, for those watching right now, we, we had the show started, and we, uh, we was leaving, and Joe left, but I stayed on because I wanted to update some stuff. Then all of a sudden, I saw the, uh, our special guest log in. I'm like, oh. So I had to go ahead and call Joe, like, uh, guess <laughs> what? <we're laughs> all in now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it happened three hours on the show. Not not our typical thing like we used to, but it's been worth it because you don't always often have a legend on your show. So it was definitely worth it. And Joe, I'm just glad, you know, for me personally that you are able to experience, you know, these moments like this to have legends like Don Hewlett to be on the show. Yep, and like I've said it many times before, um, thank you for including me in all this, you know, started working together, you included me in, in this, and I've gotten to uh, talk to a lot of awesome people, so um, this is just another one for the books. There it is. Once again, this is the Platform Sports Talk Show, your Wednesday night sports delight. We will be back next week. It's going to be fun. along with Joe. <laughs> there we go. I'm like, wait a minute. Can't you hear me? Are we still here? And we hope that y'all enjoyed the show. Sure, sure, sure. Get ready for another great show next week. We are out of here at the Platform Sports Talk Show. Have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>